So Ray, were you born in Inverclyde? I was. I was born here um, to parents who were, my father was Italian and my mother is Scottish fundamentally, but a wee bit Irish thrown in it as well. So that's interesting that your dad was from Italy. Do you know any stories that you could pass on? Uh, I do. Um, my father's father, so my grandfather, who I didn't really know because he died, he died when I was only four months old or something, but my father's father came from a little village in Italy and that village was called Stadomeli, which is near, it's up a mountain, uh, near uh, La Spezia, the nearest big kind of town, which is a port <clears throat> up in the northwest. And his mother died in childbirth uh, when he was about 14, I think, or 15. And his father just, his father kind of lost the plot and just disappeared. So he was left to look after his siblings who were younger than him. I think it was a brother and sister, I'm not sure about that. So obviously being peasants up a village, up a mountain, there wasn't an awful lot of work. So he basically left the village to find work. Uh, and he had only, he could only afford one pair of boots. So he had one pair of boots that he used to carry around his neck and walk on his bare feet. And it, when he reached the edge of the town or village, he'd put his boots on <clears throat> and go in and try and get some work. And he'd send the money, <coughs> excuse me, he'd send the money back home. Uh, and he gradually worked his way through France and everything else across to Scotland. And I, I, I don't know exactly why, whether he was aiming for Scotland or not, but by that time there would have been some Italians in the west coast of Scotland. So I don't know if, if he was advised maybe to head to there or not. I'm not sure about that. But he, he came to Scotland and he got work with um, an Italian who had him going round the door selling lace. And he, his wife was horrible. They were horrible to him. They used, his wife used to give my grandfather mouldy bread to eat. That was all she used to give him to eat. Um, and anyway, so and time passed and he must have saved some money or whatever, but he managed to eventually sort of start his own wee business. Um, and he opened a fish and chip shop in Ann Street. And he, the first thing he did was he went back to his village and he asked around to find out if his father owed anybody any money and he paid his father's debts um, because it was the honour of the family, I suppose. So that was the t kind of traditions of, of peasants. They had a real kind of, a, a very kind of very moral people about debt and things like that. Then he went back to Italy, met his future wife, married her, brought her back to Scotland, and they had four children, my father included, and three daughters. And uh, when my father was born, his mother wasn't very well. And the doctors here advised her to go back to Italy because of the climate. So she took my father, who was just a baby, she took him back to Italy. His father had to stay here, obviously, and run the shop. So his mum went back to Italy, to the village, and my father stayed there till he was eight. So by the time he said, he, by the time he came back here, he, he couldn't speak English. He spoke purely Italian. And his father he'd only seen maybe a handful of times when his father could afford to go back to Italy and spend a wee bit of time there. So... He came here, being the son, it was obviously in those days it was traditional that the son got the education. And so they put my father into a convent school. It wasn't a boarding school, just a convent school. And um, the nuns used to belt him because he couldn't speak English. Uh, and so he set his mind to, he made sure that, as he said in his own words, he said, I was determined that I was going to learn the language of the country I was going to stay in. So by the time I knew him, his English was like you and I. There was no trace of an Italian accent at all. In fact, it wasn't until I was a bit older that I realised he could speak a fluent Italian because he spoke perfect English and he spoke it to my mother all the time because she was obviously Scottish. Um, so he got the education, by the time he was 16, um, he was, get, as he said, he was getting up in the morning, going to school, but his father was already at work. He was coming home from school, doing his homework. His dad was still at work. By the time his dad came home, he said, I was in my bed. War broke out and the police turned up at the, the, um, the door and gave him 20 minutes to pack a bag, his, grand, his father, to pack a bag. And he was taken away and 
put in a prisoner of war camp in the Isle of Man. And then my dad was telling me this story and he said, I, I said, so by the time you were 16, you didn't have the relationship that I've got with you because my father was a fantastic role model. Um, and he said, no, he said, by the time I was 16, he said, pretty much my father was like a stranger because I had hardly had a chance to spend any time with him, not through any fault of his father's, but circumstances. And he said, that's the one thing I promised myself that when I had a family, I would give them time because that's the one thing my father just couldn't give me. And when he was in the prisoner of war camp, they were allowed to go and visit, I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think it was like they got one visit allowed once every three months or something, or it might have been more than that, you know, once every six months, something like that. But I don't think they could afford to go and see them that often. So by the time the war was over and, and his father came out, my father was a kind of young man in his own right by then. Um, so I can't, you know, I look at the role model my father was for me and uh, as I say, he always gave his time. He was a very calm person. My father never really shouted at you or didn't hit us or he talked to you and he gave you, he, he explained things and took time and he was a very calm person, a very warm and open person. Um, but how he developed that through no fault of the families, but how he developed that from a, having a role model of somebody who tried, who worked his, his socks off for his family to give them what he could and, you know, was a, a loving man himself, but didn't have the t he couldn't spend as much time with them. You know, I think is a, a credit to, to my father and his family and a, a credit to his, his, his own father and mother as well. But um, when the war broke out, the, the shop was ransacked um, and, uh, I, I, and I, I think that my father, I'm sure he told me that the family were upstairs above the shop and they could hear it being smashed and, um, but a lot of a lot of the regular customers uh, who used to come in uh, didn't want to be party to that, and I think they helped clear up and and things. So although there were people who obviously reacted one way, I don't think it was as, it wasn't as clear cut that everybody was like that. Um, and I know that because my grandfather had travelled to get to where he was, he had a soft spot for anybody that was that no money or was down in the luck or travelling, and. Anybody that he saw that needed a meal, he used to take them in and feed them. Uh, and I've heard many stories when I came to work here at the college, because I've got an unusual second name, people would ask me, oh, is your father an art teacher? Which my father was. And some of them even remembered his father's shop. Um, and they'd, his name is Adolfo, which probably didn't help during the war. But his name is Adolfo, my grandfather, and they'd call him Dolph, Dolph's Chippy. And they'd say, oh, we remember Big Dolph used to take us in and feed us for nothing. He would give these people food. So those were the people, I think, who felt terrible that their own countrymen had smashed up the shop. And so they went and I think helped clear up and because they felt mm -hmm. really awful about that. What happened to the business while he was interred? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'd imagine they must have kept it running. Um, but as I say, that's a kind of period that I don't know an awful lot about. And then... Um, Eventually, my aunts, all my, my three aunts, married, and they all independently had had shops. They all had cafes. My aunt Lena had Kenefi's Cafe that used to be in Captain Street. Um, my aunt Maria had a, a wee cafe shop. It wasn't a cafe; it was more of a sweet shop and stuff uh, up in Belleville Street. Um, and my aunt Rosetta, her husband started Muros the ice cream vans, Dom, but he died quite young and his brothers took it over. Uh, well, they, he'd brought his brothers on board as partners and when he died, they carried it on. So again, I was only a, a wee boy when Uncle Dom died, but he started the whole Muros, um, the whole Muros thing. And in fact, my cousin, uh, uh, recently at a, at a party, my cousin showed me some photographs uh, of her, her father's. And there's, they're great pictures. There's pictures of him beside one of the original Muro's vans, because uh, he was a mechanic. He started as a mechanic. And if you think about it, Muro's did the ice cream vans, but they also were a garage, a coach builders in a garage. And um, they're great pictures. They're, they're, they're phenomenal. They look a wee bit like something that the Godfather, uh, because he looks great, but there's big pictures of him with his double-breasted suit on. And then there's some strange ones of him and his brothers and, and things, and his, his relatives, his cousins. And it looks like they've been taking the photographers, 
but they've all got instruments. But none of them played an instrument, but they've all got like trumpets and squeeze boxes and stuff. And they look like a kind of band, a kind of one of these travelling bands or something. And I said, did Uncle Dom play it? No, no, he didn't play an instrument. So it must have just been props for the photographs, but it looks quite, it's like something from the Marx Brothers. It's kind of strange, but they're all those kind of things, you know, so there's, uh, when you look back, but the, the sad fact is that only one of my aunts is still alive and she's basically kind of bed bound now and, and, and not well, but so a lot of those stories are now gone. A lot of that history we don't have uh, because we, it, you know, they may have passed on some of the stories, but you know, not enough. The, the first hand experience aye, that we uh, got. And you know, we probably, when we were young, didn't bother to sit them down and say, tell me everything. No. We probably just went, oh, there's granny or auntie off again. Uh, and in reality, you know, those those stories are so important. And the strange thing about my, the thing about my grandfather being thrown in a prisoner of war camp because he was obviously seen as a, an undesirable alien was that my father was called up to do British National Service. So they threw his father in a prisoner of war camp and then called my father up to do his national service to defend Britain, do you know what I mean? And did he? Did he oh, do aye, yeah, 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 he did. Yeah. We used to laugh about it actually because he used to say to us all the time, I was in the army, you know, and I, and then he told me one day that he they, they were short of rifles, so he never got a rifle. All he ever got was a, it was like a broom handle, right? So, so we used to laugh about it. Um, and then he used to tell his favourite joke of all time. He used to say to us, uh, when I was in the army, I was in the army with a guy called John Smelly, but he hated his name so much he changed it. We'd say, what did he change it to, Dad? And he'd say, Jim Smelly. And my dad would then get into guffaws of laughter because he thought that was the funniest thing ever. Uh, I can see his face right now. He'd still be laughing at it. Well, thanks. It's been great and it's been great to hear their You're stories welcome. and that reality of what made you laugh, what made them laugh at the time. Okay, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you.